The Space Shuttle was a partially reusable low Earth orbital spacecraft system operated by the U.S. National Aeronautics and Space Administration NASA as part of the Space Shuttle program. Its official program name was Space Transportation System STS, taken from a 1969 plan for a system of reusable spacecraft of which it was the only item funded for development. The first of four orbital test flights occurred in 1981, leading to operational flights beginning in 1982. In addition to the prototype whose completion was cancelled, five complete shuttle systems were built and used on a total of 135 missions from 1981 to 2011, launched from the Kennedy Space Center KSC in Florida. Operational missions launched numerous satellites, interplanetary probes, and the Hubble Space Telescope HST, conducted science experiments in orbit, and participated in construction and servicing of the International Space Station. The shuttle fleet's total mission time was 1322 days, 19 hours, 21 minutes and 23 seconds. Shuttle components included the orbiter vehicle OV with three clustered Rocketdyne RS-25 main engines, a pair of recoverable solid rocket boosters SRBs, and the expendable external tank ET containing liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen oxygen. The Space Shuttle was launched vertically, like a conventional rocket, with the two SRBs operating in parallel with the OV's three main engines, which were fueled from the ET. The SRBs were jettisoned before the vehicle reached orbit, and the ET was jettisoned just before orbit insertion, which used the orbiter's two orbital maneuvering system ohms engines. At the conclusion of the mission, the orbiter fired its ohms to de-orbit and re-enter the atmosphere. The orbiter then glided as a spaceplane to a runway landing, usually to the shuttle landing facility at Kennedy Space Center, Florida or Rogers Dry Lake in Edwards Air Force Base, California. After landing at Edwards, the orbiter was flown back to the KSC on the shuttle carrier aircraft, a specially modified Boeing 747. The first orbiter, Enterprise, was built in 1976, used in approach and landing tests and had no orbital capability. Four fully operational orbiters were initially built, Columbia, Challenger, Discovery, and Atlantis. Of these, two were lost in mission accidents, Challenger in 1986 and Columbia in 2003, with a total of 14 astronauts killed. A fifth operational and sixth in total orbiter, Endeavour, was built in 1991 to replace Challenger. The Space Shuttle was retired from service upon the conclusion of Atlantis's final flight on July 21, 2011. The U.S. has since relied on the Russian Soyuz spacecraft to transport astronauts to the International Space Station, pending the commercial crew development and space launch system programs on schedule for first flights in 2019 and 2020. Topic. Overview The vehicle consisted of a spaceplane for orbit and re-entry, fueled from an expendable external tank containing liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, with two reusable strap-on solid rocket boosters. The first of four orbital test flights occurred in 1981, leading to operational flights beginning in 1982, all launched from the Kennedy Space Center, Florida. 
The system was retired from service in 2011 after 135 missions, with Atlantis making the final launch of the three-decade shuttle program on July 8, 2011. The program ended after Atlantis landed at the Kennedy Space Center on July 21, 2011. Major missions included launching numerous satellites and interplanetary probes, conducting space science experiments, and servicing and construction of space stations. A total of five operational orbiters were built, and of these, two were destroyed in accidents. It was used for orbital space missions by NASA, the U.S. Department of Defense, the European Space Agency, Japan, and Germany. The United States funded shuttle development and operations except for the Spacelab modules used on D-1 and D-2—sponsored by Germany. SLJ was partially funded by Japan. At launch, it consisted of the stack, including the dark orange external tank ET. For the first two launches the tank was painted white, two white, slender solid rocket boosters SRBs, and the orbiter vehicle, which contained the crew and payload. Some payloads were launched into higher orbits with either of two different upper stages developed for the STS single stage payload assist module or two stage inertial upper stage. The space shuttle was stacked in the vehicle assembly building, and the stack mounted on a mobile launch platform held down by four frangible nuts on each SRB, which were detonated at launch. The shuttle stack launched vertically like a conventional rocket. It lifted off under the power of its two SRBs and three main engines, which were fueled by liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen from the ET. The Space Shuttle had a two-stage ascent. The SRBs provided additional thrust during liftoff and first-stage flight. About two minutes after liftoff, frangible nuts were fired, releasing the SRBs, which then parachuted into the ocean, to be retrieved by NASA recovery ships for refurbishment and reuse. The orbiter and ET continued to ascend on an increasingly horizontal flight path under power from its main engines. Upon reaching 17,500 miles per hour, 7.8 kilometers per second, necessary for low Earth orbit, the main engines were shut down. The ET, attached by two frangible nuts, was then jettisoned to burn up in the atmosphere. After jettisoning the external tank, the orbital maneuvering system (OMS) engines were used to adjust the orbit. The orbiter carried astronauts and payloads such as satellites or space station parts into low Earth orbit, the Earth's upper atmosphere or thermosphere. Usually, five to seven crew members rode in the orbiter. Two crew members, the commander and pilot, were sufficient for a minimal flight, as in the first four test flights, STS-1 through STS-4. The typical payload capacity was about 50,045 pounds, 22,700 kilograms, but could be increased depending on the choice of launch configuration. The orbiter carried its payload in a large cargo bay with doors that opened along the length of its top, a feature which made the space shuttle unique among spacecraft. This feature made possible the deployment of large satellites such as the Hubble Space Telescope and also the capture and return of large payloads back to Earth. When the orbiter's space mission was complete, it fired its OMS thrusters to drop out of orbit and re-enter the lower atmosphere. During descent, the orbiter passed through different layers of the atmosphere and decelerated from hypersonic speed primarily by aerobraking. 
In the lower atmosphere and landing phase, it was more like a glider but with reaction control system RCS, thrusters and fly-by-wire controlled hydraulically actuated flight surfaces controlling its descent. It landed on a long runway as a conventional aircraft. The aerodynamic shape was a compromise between the demands of radically different speeds and air pressures during re-entry, hypersonic flight, and subsonic atmospheric flight. As a result, the orbiter had a relatively high sink rate at low altitudes, and it transitioned during re-entry from using RCS thrusters at very high altitudes to flight surfaces in the lower atmosphere. Topic. Design and development Topic. Historical background During the 1950s, the United States Air Force proposed using a resuable piloted glider to perform military operations such as reconnaissance, satellite attack, and employing air-to-ground weapons. In the late 1950s, the Air Force began developing the partially reusable X-20 Dinosaur. The Air Force collaborated with NASA on the Dinosaur, and began training six pilots in June 1961. The rising costs of development and the prioritization of Project Gemini led to the cancellation of the Dinosaur program in December 1963. In addition to the Dinosaur, the Air Force conducted a study in 1957 to test the feasibility of reusable boosters. This became the basis for the aerospace plane, a fully reusable spacecraft that was never developed beyond the initial design phase in 1962-1963. Beginning in the early 1950s, NASA and the Air Force collaborated on developing lifting bodies to test aircraft that primarily generated lift from their fuselages instead of wings, and tested the M2F1. M2F2, M2F3, HL10, X24A, and the X24B. The program tested aerodynamic characteristics that would later be applied to the Space Shuttle, including unpowered landing from a high altitude and speed. Topic: <laughs> Design process. In September 1966, NASA and the Air Force released a joint study concluding that a new vehicle was required to satisfy their respective future demands, and that a partially reusable system would be the most cost-effective solution. The head of the NASA Office of Manned Space Flight, George Muller, announced the plan for a reusable shuttle on August 10, 1968. NASA issued a request for proposal RFP for designs of the Integrated Launch and Reentry Vehicle ILRV, which would later become the Space Shuttle. Rather than award a contract based upon initial proposals, NASA announced a phased approach for the Space Shuttle contracting and development. Phase A was a request for studies completed by competing aerospace companies. Phase B was a competition between two contractors for a specific contract. Phase C involved designing the details of the spacecraft components, and Phase D was the production of the spacecraft. In December 1968, NASA created the Space Shuttle Task Group to determine the optimal design for a reusable space spacecraft, and issued study contracts to General Dynamics, Lockheed, McDonnell Douglas, and North American Rockwell. 
In July 1969, the Space Shuttle Task Group issued a report that determined that the shuttle would be required to support a space station, launch, service, and retrieve satellites, and support short-duration manned missions. The report also created three classes of a future reusable shuttle. Class 1 would have a reusable orbiter mounted on expendable boosters, Class 2 would use stage and a half staging, and Class 3 would have both a reusable orbiter and booster. In September 1969, the Space Task Group, under leadership of Vice President Spiro Agnew, issued a report calling for the development of a space shuttle to bring people and cargo to low Earth orbit LEO, as well as a space tug to for transfers between orbits and the Moon, and a reusable nuclear stage for deep space travel. After the release of the Space Shuttle Task Group report, many aerospace engineers favored the Class III, fully reusable design because of perceived savings in hardware costs. Max Faggett, a NASA engineer who had worked to design the Mercury capsule, patented a design for a two-stage fully recoverable system with a straight-winged orbiter mounted on a larger straight-winged booster. The Air Force Flight Dynamics Laboratory argued that a straight-wing design would not be able to withstand the high thermal and aerodynamic stresses during re-entry, and would not provide the required cross-range capability. Additionally, the Air Force required a larger payload capacity than Faggot's design allowed. In January 1971, NASA and Air Force leadership decided that a reusable delta wing orbiter mounted on an expendable propellant take would be the optimal design for the Space Shuttle. After establishing the need for a reusable, heavy lift spacecraft, NASA and the Air Force began determining the design requirements of their respective services. The Air Force expected to launch large satellites into a polar orbit, and that the Space Shuttle have a 15 by 60 foot payload bay, 1,100 mile cross range, and the capacity to lift 65,000 pounds to an easterly low Earth orbit, and 40,000 pounds into polar orbit. NASA evaluated the F-1 and J-2 engines from the Saturn rockets, and determined that they were insufficient for the requirements of the Space Shuttle, and in July 1971, it issued a contract to Rocketdyne to begin development on the RS-25 engine. NASA reviewed 29 potential designs for the Space Shuttle. NASA determined that a design with two side boosters should be used, and the boosters should be reusable to reduce costs. NASA and the Air Force elected to use solid propellant boosters because of the lower costs and the ease of refurbishing them for reuse after they landed in the ocean. In January 1972, President Richard Nixon approved the shuttle, and NASA decided on its final design in March. In August 1972, NASA awarded the contract to build the orbiter to North American Rockwell, the solid rocket booster contract to Morton Thiokol, and the external tank contract to Martin Marietta. Topic development On June 4, 1974, Rockwell began construction on the first shuttle, Orbiter Vehicle OV-101, which would later be named Enterprise. Enterprise was designed as a test vehicle, and did not include engines or heat shielding. Construction was completed on September 17, 1976, and Enterprise was moved to Edwards AFB to begin testing. Rockwell also constructed the main propulsion test article MPTA-098, which was later fit with RS-25 engines and tested at the National Space Technology Laboratory NSTL. 
Rockwell conducted structural tests on structural test article STA 099 to determine the effect of aerodynamic stresses, the beginning of the development of the RS-25 Space Shuttle main engine was delayed for nine months while Pratt & Whitney challenged the contract that had been issued to Rocketdyne. The first engine was completed in March 1975, after issues with developing the first throttleable, reusable engine. During engine testing, the RS-25 experienced multiple nozzle failures, as well as broken turbine blades. Despite the problems during testing, NASA ordered the nine RS-25 engines needed for its three orbiters under construction in May 1978. NASA experienced significant delays in the development of the Space Shuttle's thermal protection system. Previous NASA spacecraft had used ablative heat shields, but those could not be reused. NASA chose to use ceramic tiles for thermal protection, as the shuttle could then be constructed of lightweight aluminum, and the tiles could be individually replaced as needed. Construction began on Columbia on March 27, 1975, and it was delivered to the Kennedy Space Center KSC on March 25, 1979. At the time of its arrival at the KSC, Columbia still had 6,000 of its 30,000 tiles remaining to be installed. However, many of the tiles that had been originally installed had to be replaced, requiring two years of installation before Columbia could fly. On January 5, 1979, NASA commissioned a second orbiter. Later that month, Rockwell began coverting STA-099 to OV-099, later named Challenger. On January 29, 1979, NASA ordered two additional orbiters, OV-103 and OV-104, which were named Discovery and Atlantis. Construction of OV-105, later named Endeavour, began in February 1982, but NASA decided to limit the Space Shuttle fleet to four orbiters in 1983. After the loss of Challenger, NASA resumed production of Endeavour in September 1987. Topic. Testing. After it arrived at Edwards AFB, Enterprise underwent flight testing with the shuttle carrier aircraft, a Boeing 747 that was modified to carry the orbiter. In February 1977, Enterprise it began the approach and landing tests and underwent captive flights, where it remained attached to the shuttle carrier aircraft for the duration of the flight. On August 12, 1977, Enterprise conducted its first glide test, where it detached from the shuttle carrier aircraft and landed at Edwards AFB. After four additional flights, Enterprise was moved to the Marshall Space Flight Center on March 13, 1978. Enterprise underwent shake tests in the mated vertical ground vibration test, where it was attached to an external tank and solid rocket boosters, and underwent vibrations to simulate the stresses of launch. In April 1979, Enterprise was taken to the Kennedy Space Center, where it was attached to an external tank and solid rocket boosters, and moved to LC-39. Once installed at the launch pad, the Space Shuttle was used to verify the proper positioning of launch complex hardware. 
Enterprise was taken back to California in August 1979, and later served in the development of the SLC 6 at Vandenberg AFB in 1984. On November 26, 1980, Columbia was mated with its external tank and solid rocket boosters, and was moved to LC 39 on December 29, 1980. The first Space Shuttle mission, STS-1, would be the first time NASA performed a crewed first flight of a spacecraft. On April 12, 1981, the Space Shuttle launched for the first time, and was piloted by John Young and Robert Crippen. During the two-day mission, Young and Crippen tested equipment on board the shuttle, and found several of the ceramic tiles had fallen off the top side of the Columbia. NASA coordinated with the Air Force to use satellites to image the underside of Columbia, and determined there was no damage. Columbia re-entered the atmosphere on April 14, and landed at Edwards AFB. NASA conducted three additional test flights with Columbia in 1981 and 1982. On July 4, 1982, STS-4, flown by Ken Mattingly and Henry Hartsfield, landed at Edwards AFB. President Ronald Reagan and his wife Nancy met the crew, and delivered a speech. After STS-4, NASA declared the Space Shuttle operational. <laughs> <laughs> Description The Space Shuttle was the first operational orbital spacecraft designed for reuse. Each shuttle was designed for a projected lifespan of 100 launches or 10 years of operational life, although this was later extended. Each space shuttle was a reusable launch system composed of three main assemblies, the reusable OV, the expendable ET, and the two reusable SRBs. Only the OV entered orbit shortly after the tank and boosters are jettisoned. The vehicle was launched vertically like a conventional rocket, and the orbiter glided to a horizontal landing like an airplane, after which it was refurbished for reuse. The SRBs parachuted to splashdown in the ocean where they were towed back to shore and refurbished for later shuttle missions. Five operational OVs were built, Columbia OV-102, Challenger OV-099, Discovery OV-103, Atlantis OV-104, and Endeavour OV-105. A mock-up, Inspiration, currently stands at the entrance to the Astronaut Hall of Fame. An additional craft, Enterprise OV-101, was built for atmospheric testing gliding and landing. It was originally intended to be outfitted for orbital operations after the test program, but it was found more economical to upgrade the structural test article STA-099 into Orbiter Challenger OV-099. An additional test article, dubbed Pathfinder OV-098, was built for form and fit tests, and is on display at the Alabama Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Challenger disintegrated 73 seconds after launch in 1986, and Endeavour was built as a replacement from structural spare components. Building Endeavour cost about $1.7 billion. Columbia broke apart over Texas during re-entry in 2003. A Space Shuttle launch cost around $450 million. Roger A. Peelk Jr. has estimated that the Space Shuttle program cost about $170 billion $2008 through early 2008, the average cost per flight was about $1.5 billion. 
Two missions were paid for by Germany, Spacelab D-1 and D-2 D for Deutschland with a payload control center in Oberpfaffenhofen. D-1 was the first time that control of a manned STS mission payload was not in U.S. hands, at times, the orbiter itself was referred to as the Space Shuttle. This was not technically correct as the Space Shuttle was the combination of the orbiter, the external tank, and the two solid rocket boosters. These components, once assembled in the Vehicle Assembly Building originally built to assemble the Apollo Saturn V rocket, were commonly referred to as the stack. Responsibility for the shuttle components was spread among multiple NASA field centers. The Kennedy Space Center was responsible for launch, landing and turnaround operations for equatorial orbits the only orbit profile actually used in the program. The U.S. Air Force at the Vandenberg Air Force Base was responsible for launch, landing and turnaround operations for polar orbits though this was never used. The Johnson Space Center served as the central point for all shuttle operations. The Marshall Space Flight Center was responsible for the main engines, external tank, and solid rocket boosters, the John C. Stennis Space Center handled main engine testing, and the Goddard Space Flight Center managed the global tracking network. <laughs> Orbiter vehicle The orbiter resembled a conventional aircraft, with double delta wings swept 81 degrees at the inner leading edge and 45 degrees at the outer leading edge. Its vertical stabilizer's leading edge was swept back at a 50 degrees angle. The 411s, mounted at the trailing edge of the wings, and the rudder, speed brake, attached at the trailing edge of the stabilizer, with the body flap, controlled the orbiter during descent and landing. The orbiter's 60-foot long payload bay, comprising most of the fuselage, could accommodate cylindrical payloads up to 15 feet meters in diameter. Information declassified in 2011 showed that these measurements were chosen specifically to accommodate the KH-9 Hexagon spy satellite operated by the National Reconnaissance Office. Two mostly symmetrical lengthwise payload bay doors hinged on either side of the bay comprised its entire top. Payloads were generally loaded horizontally into the bay while the orbiter was standing upright on the launch pad and unloaded vertically in the near weightless orbital environment by the orbiter's robotic remote manipulator arm under astronaut control, EVA astronauts, or under the payload's own power as for satellites attached to a rocket. Upper stage. For deployment. Three Space Shuttle main engines SSMEs were mounted on the orbiter's aft fuselage in a triangular pattern. The engine nozzles could gimbal 10.5 degrees up and down, and 8.5 degrees from side to side during ascent to change the direction of their thrust to steer the shuttle. The orbiter structure was made primarily from aluminum alloy, although the engine structure was made primarily from titanium alloy. The operational orbiters built were OV-102 Columbia, OV-099 Challenger, OV-103 Discovery, OV-104 Atlantis, and OV-105 Endeavour. Topic. External tank The main function of the Space Shuttle external tank was to supply the liquid oxygen and hydrogen fuel to the main engines. 
it was also the backbone of the launch vehicle, providing attachment points for the two solid rocket boosters and the orbiter. The external tank was the only part of the shuttle system that was not reused. Although the external tanks were always discarded, it would have been possible to take them into orbit and reuse them such as a wet workshop for incorporation into a space station. Topic: <laughs> Solid rocket boosters. Two solid rocket boosters SRBs each provided 12,500 kN lbf of thrust at liftoff, which was 83% of the total thrust at liftoff. The SRBs were jettisoned two minutes after launch at a height of about 46 kilometers (150,000 feet), and then deployed parachutes and landed in the ocean to be recovered. The SRB cases were made of steel about one half inch (13 millimeters) thick. The solid rocket boosters were reused many times. The casing used in Ares I engine testing in 2009 consisted of motor cases that had been flown, collectively, on 48 shuttle missions, including STS 1. Astronauts who have flown on multiple spacecraft report that shuttle delivers a rougher ride than Apollo or Soyuz. The additional vibration is caused by the solid rocket boosters, as solid fuel does not burn as evenly as liquid fuel. The vibration dampens down after the solid rocket boosters have been jettisoned. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Orbiter cargo bay add-ons. The orbiter could be used in conjunction with a variety of add-on components depending on the mission. This included orbital laboratories, space lab, space hab, boosters for launching payloads farther into space, inertial upper stage, payload assist module, and other functions, such as provided by extended duration orbiter, multipurpose logistics modules, or Canadarm RMS. An upper stage called Transfer Orbit Stage Orbital Science Corp. TOS-21 was also used once with the orbiter. Other types of systems and racks were part of the modular Spacelab system. Pallets, Igloo, IPS, etc., which also supported special missions such as SRTM. Topic. Space Lab In 1973, European ministers met in Belgium to authorize Western Europe's manned orbital project and its main contribution to Space Shuttle the Space Lab program. Spacelab would provide a multidisciplinary orbital space laboratory and additional space equipment for the shuttle. Supported by a modular system of pressurized modules, pallets, and systems, Spacelab missions executed on multidisciplinary science, orbital logistics, and international cooperation. Over 29 missions flew on subjects ranging from astronomy, microgravity, radar, and life sciences, to name a few. Spacelab hardware also supported missions such as Hubble HST servicing and space station resupply. STS-2 and STS-3 provided testing, and the first full mission was Spacelab-1 STS-9 launched on November 28, 1983. Spacelab formally began in 1973, after a meeting in Brussels, Belgium, by European heads of state. Within the decade, Spacelab went into orbit and provided Europe and the United States with an orbital workshop and hardware system. 
international cooperation, science, and exploration were realized on Spacelab. Flight systems The shuttle was one of the earliest craft to use a computerized fly-by-wire digital flight control system. This means no mechanical or hydraulic linkages connected the pilot's control stick to the control surfaces or reaction control system thrusters. The control algorithm, which used a classical proportional integral derivative PID approach, was developed and maintained by Honeywell. The shuttle's fly-by-wire digital flight control system was composed of four control systems each addressing a different mission phase, ascent, descent, on orbit and aborts. Honeywell is also credited with the design and implementation of the shuttle's nose wheel steering control algorithm that allowed the orbiter to safely land at Kennedy Space Center's shuttle runway. A concern with using digital fly by wire systems on the shuttle was reliability. Considerable research went into the shuttle computer system. The shuttle used five identical redundant IBM 32-bit general purpose computers GPCs, model AP101, constituting a type of embedded system. Four computers ran specialized software called the Primary Avionics Software System PASS. A fifth backup computer ran separate software called the Backup Flight System BFS. Collectively they were called the Data Processing System DPS. The design goal of the shuttle's DPS was fail operational, fail safe reliability. After a single failure, the shuttle could still continue the mission. After two failures, it could still land safely. The four general-purpose computers operated essentially in lockstep, checking each other. If one computer provided a different result than the other three i.e. the one computer failed, the three functioning computers voted it out of the system. This isolated it from vehicle control. If a second computer of the three remaining failed, the two functioning computers voted it out. A very unlikely failure mode would have been where two of the computers produced result A, and two produced result B A2 split. In this unlikely case, one group of two was to be picked at random. The Backup Flight System BFS was separately developed software running on the fifth computer, used only if the entire four-computer primary system failed. The BFS was created because although the four primary computers were hardware redundant, they all ran the same software, so a generic software problem could crash all of them. Embedded system avionics software was developed under totally different conditions from public commercial software. The number of code lines was tiny compared to a public commercial software product. Changes were only made infrequently and with extensive testing, and many programming and test personnel worked on the small amount of computer code. However, in theory it could have still failed, and the BFS existed for that contingency. While the BFS could run in parallel with PASS, the BFS never engaged to take over control from PASS during any shuttle mission. The software for the shuttle computers was written in a high-level language called HAL.S, somewhat similar to Place I. It is specifically designed for a real-time embedded system environment. The IBM AP101 computers originally had about 424 kilobytes of magnetic core memory each. 
the CPU could process about 400,000 instructions per second. They had no hard disk drive, and loaded software from magnetic tape cartridges. In 1990, the original computers were replaced with an upgraded model AP101S, which had about 2.5 times the memory capacity about 1 megabyte and 3 times the processor speed about 1.2 million instructions per second. The memory was changed from magnetic core to semiconductor with battery backup. Early shuttle missions, starting in November 1983, took along the grid compass, arguably one of the first laptop computers. The grid was given the name SPOC, for Shuttle Portable Onboard Computer. Use on the shuttle required both hardware and software modifications which were incorporated into later versions of the commercial product. It was used to monitor and display the shuttle's ground position, path of the next two orbits, show where the shuttle had line-of-sight communications with ground stations, and determine points for location-specific observations of the Earth. The Compass sold poorly, as it cost at least $8,000, but it offered unmatched performance for its weight and size. NASA was one of its main customers. During its service life, the shuttle's control system never experienced a failure. Many of the lessons learned have been used to design today's high speed control algorithms. <laughs> Orbiter markings and insignia The prototype Orbiter Enterprise originally had a flag of the United States on the upper surface of the left wing and the letters USA in black on the right wing. The name Enterprise was painted in black on the payload bay doors just above the hinge and behind the crew module. On the aft end of the payload bay doors was the NASA worm. Logotype in gray. Underneath the rear of the payload bay doors on the side of the fuselage just above the wing is the text, United States, in black with a flag of the United States ahead of it. The first operational orbiter, Columbia, originally had the same markings as Enterprise, although the letters, USA, on the right wing were slightly larger and spaced farther apart. Columbia also had black markings which Enterprise lacked on its forward RCS module, around the cockpit windows, and on its vertical stabilizer, and had distinctive black chines on the forward part of its upper wing surfaces, which none of the other orbiters had. Challenger established a modified marking scheme for the shuttle fleet that was matched by Discovery, Atlantis and Endeavour. The letters, USA, in black above an American flag were displayed on the left wing, with the NASA, Worm, logotype in gray centered above the name of the orbiter in black on the right wing. The name of the orbiter was inscribed not on the payload bay doors, but on the forward fuselage just below and behind the cockpit windows. This would make the name visible when the shuttle was photographed in orbit with the doors open. In 1983, Enterprise had its wing markings changed to match Challenger, and the NASA worm. Logotype on the aft end of the payload bay doors was changed from gray to black. Some black markings were added to the nose, cockpit windows and vertical tail to more closely resemble the flight vehicles, but the name, Enterprise, remained on the payload bay doors as there was never any need to open them. 
Columbia had its name moved to the forward fuselage to match the other flight vehicles after STS 61C. During the 1986 88 hiatus, when the shuttle fleet was grounded following the loss of Challenger, but retained its original wing markings until its last overhaul, after STS 93, and its unique black chines for the remainder of its operational life. Beginning in 1998, the flight vehicle's markings were modified to incorporate the NASA meatball insignia. The worm logotype, which the agency had phased out, was removed from the payload bay doors and the meatball insignia was added aft of the United States text on the lower aft fuselage. The Meatball insignia was also displayed on the left wing, with the American flag above the orbiter's name, left justified rather than centered, on the right wing. The three surviving flight vehicles, Discovery, Atlantis and Endeavour, still bear these markings as museum displays. Enterprise became the property of the Smithsonian Institution in 1985 and was no longer under NASA's control when these changes were made, hence the prototype orbiter still has its 1983 markings and still has its name on the payload bay doors. Topic. Upgrades. The Space Shuttle was initially developed in the 1970s, but received many upgrades and modifications afterward to improve performance, reliability and safety. Internally, the Shuttle remained largely similar to the original design, with the exception of the improved avionics computers. In addition to the computer upgrades, the original analog primary flight instruments were replaced with modern full-color, flat-panel display screens, called a glass cockpit, which is similar to those of contemporary airliners. To facilitate construction of ISS, the internal airlocks of each orbiter except Columbia were replaced with external docking systems to allow for a greater amount of cargo to be stored on the shuttle's mid-deck during station resupply missions. The Space Shuttle main engines SSMEs had several improvements to enhance reliability and power. This explains phrases such as, main engines throttling up to 104%. This did not mean the engines were being run over a safe limit. The 100% figure was the original specified power level. During the lengthy development program, Rocketdyne determined the engine was capable of safe reliable operation at 104% of the originally specified thrust. NASA could have rescaled the output number, saying in essence 104% is now 100%. To clarify this would have required revising much previous documentation and software, so the 104% number was retained. SSME upgrades were denoted as block numbers, such as block I, block II, and block IIA. The upgrades improved engine reliability, maintainability and performance. The 109% thrust level was finally reached in flight hardware with the Block II engines in 2001. The normal maximum throttle was 104%, with 106% or 109% used for mission aborts. For the first two missions, STS-1 and STS-2, the external tank was painted white to protect the insulation that covers much of the tank, but improvements and testing showed that it was not required. The weight saved by not painting the tank resulted in an increase in payload capability to orbit. 
Additional weight was saved by removing some of the internal stringers in the hydrogen tank that proved unnecessary. The resulting lightweight external tank was first flown on STS-6 and used on the majority of shuttle missions. STS-91 saw the first flight of the super lightweight external tank. This version of the tank was made of the 2195 aluminum lithium alloy. It weighed 3.4 metric tons, 7500 pounds, less than the last run of lightweight tanks, allowing the shuttle to deliver heavy elements to ISS's high inclination orbit. As the shuttle was always operated with a crew, each of these improvements was first flown on operational mission flights. The solid rocket boosters underwent improvements as well. Design engineers added a third O-ring seal to the joints between the segments after the 1986 Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. Several other SRB improvements were planned to improve performance and safety, but never came to be. These culminated in the considerably simpler, lower cost, probably safer and better performing advanced solid rocket booster. These rockets entered production in the early to mid-1990s to support the space station, but were later cancelled to save money after the expenditure of $2.2 billion. The loss of the ASRB program resulted in the development of the Super Lightweight External Tank SLWT, which provided some of the increased payload capability, while not providing any of the safety improvements. In addition, the U.S. Air Force developed their own much lighter single-piece SRB design using a filament wound system, but this too was cancelled. STS-70 was delayed in 1995, when woodpeckers bored holes in the foam insulation of Discovery's external tank. Since then, NASA has installed commercial plastic owl decoys and inflatable owl balloons which had to be removed prior to launch. The delicate nature of the foam insulation had been the cause of damage to the thermal protection system, the tile heat shield and heat wrap of the orbiter. NASA remained confident that this damage, while it was the primary cause of the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster on February 1, 2003, would not jeopardize the completion of the International Space Station in the projected time allotted. A cargo-only, unmanned variant of the shuttle was variously proposed and rejected since the 1980s. It was called the Shuttle C, and would have traded reusability for cargo capability, with large potential savings from reusing technology developed for the Space Shuttle. Another proposal was to convert the payload bay into a passenger area, with versions ranging from 30 to 74 seats, three days in orbit, and cost $1.5 million per seat. On the first four shuttle missions, astronauts wore modified U.S. Air Force high altitude full pressure suits, which included a full pressure helmet during ascent and descent. From the fifth flight, STS-5, until the loss of Challenger, one-piece light blue Nomex flight suits and partial pressure helmets were worn. A less bulky, partial pressure version of the high-altitude pressure suits with a helmet was reinstated when shuttle flights resumed in 1988. The launch entry suit ended its service life in late 1995, and was replaced by the Full Pressure Advanced Crew Escape Suit ACES, which resembled the Gemini space suit in design, but retained the orange color of the launch entry suit. 
To extend the duration that orbiters could stay docked at the ISS, the Station to Shuttle Power Transfer System was installed. The SSPTS allowed these orbiters to use power provided by the ISS to preserve their consumables. The SSPTS was first used successfully on STS-118. Topic: Specifications. Orbiter for Endeavour OV-105. Length: 122.17 feet (37.237 meters). Wingspan: 78.06 feet (23.79 meters). Height: 56.58 feet (17.25 meters). Empty weight: 172,000 pounds (78,000 kilograms). Gross liftoff weight orbiter only 240,000 pounds 110,000 kilograms Maximum landing weight 230,000 pounds 100,000 kilograms Payload to landing return payload 32,000 pounds 14,400 kilograms Maximum payload 55250 pounds 25060 kilograms Payload to LEO 204 kilometers 110 nmi at 28.5 degrees inclination 27500 kilograms 60600 pounds Payload to LEO 407 kilometers 220 nmi at 51.6 degrees to ISS 16050 kilograms 35380 pounds Payload to GTO 8390 pounds 3806 kilograms Payload to polar orbit 28000 pounds 12700 kilograms Note launch payloads modified by external tank ET choice ET LWT or SLWT Payload bay dimensions 15 by 59 feet 4.6 by 18 meters diameter by length Operational altitude 100 to 520 nmi 190 to 960 kilometers 120 to 600 miles Speed 7743 meters per second 27870 kilometers per hour 17320 miles per hour Cross range 1085 nmi 2009 kilometers 1249 miles Main stage SSME with external tank Engines 3 Rocketdyne Block 2 SSMEs each with a sea level thrust of 393800 lbf 1752 kilonewtons at 104% power Thrust at liftoff, sea level, 104% power, all three engines, 1,181,400 lbf, 5,255 kilonewtons. Specific impulse, 455 seconds, 4.46 kilometers per second. Burn time, 480 s. Fuel, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. Orbital maneuvering system. Engines, 2 ohms engines. Thrust, 53.4 kN, 12,000 lbf. Combined total vacuum thrust. 
specific impulse 316 seconds 3.10 kilometers per second burn time 150 to 250 s typical burn 1250 s d orbit burn fuel mmh n204 crew varies the earliest shuttle flights had the minimum crew of 2 many later missions a crew of 5 by program end typically 7 people would fly commander pilot several mission specialists one of whom ms2 acted as the flight engineer starting with sts9 in 1983 on two occasions, eight astronauts have flown STS-61A, STS-71. Eleven people could be accommodated in an emergency mission CSTS-3XX, external tank for SLWT. Length, 46.9 meters 153.8 feet Diameter, 8.4 meters, 27.6 feet. Propellant volume, 2,025 cubic meters, 534,900 U.S. gal. Empty weight, 26,535 kilograms, 58,500 pounds. Gross liftoff weight for tank 756,000 kilograms 1,670,000 pounds solid rocket boosters length 45.46 meters 149 feet diameter 3.71 meters 12.2 feet Empty weight each, 68,000 kilograms, 150,000 pounds. Gross liftoff weight each, 571,000 kilograms, 1,260,000 pounds. Thrust at liftoff, sea level, each, 12,500 kN, 2,800,000 lbf. Specific impulse, 269 seconds, 2. 64 kilometers per second. Burn time, 124 system stack. Height, 56 meters, 180 feet. Gross liftoff weight, 2 million kilograms, 4,400,000 pounds. Total liftoff thrust, 30,160 kN 6,780,000 lbf. Mission profile Launch preparation All Space Shuttle missions were launched from Kennedy Space Center KSC. The weather criteria used for launch included, but were not limited to, precipitation, temperatures, cloud cover, lightning forecast, wind, and humidity. The shuttle was not launched under conditions where it could have been struck by lightning. Aircraft are often struck by lightning with no adverse effects because the electricity of the strike is dissipated through its conductive structure and the aircraft is not electrically grounded. Like most jet airliners, the shuttle was mainly constructed of conductive aluminum, which would normally shield and protect the internal systems. However, upon liftoff the shuttle sent out a long exhaust plume as it ascended, and this plume could have triggered lightning by providing a current path to ground. The NASA ANVIL rule for a shuttle launch stated that an ANVIL cloud could not appear within a distance of 10 nautical miles. The shuttle launch weather officer monitored conditions until the final decision to scrub a launch was announced. 
In addition, the weather conditions had to be acceptable at one of the transatlantic abort landing sites one of several space shuttle abort modes to launch as well as the solid rocket booster recovery area. While the shuttle might have safely endured a lightning strike, a similar strike caused problems on Apollo 12, so for safety NASA chose not to launch the shuttle if lightning was possible 8,715 Nepalese rupees and 50 paise. Historically, the shuttle was not launched if its flight would run from December to January a year-end rollover or Yarrow. Its flight software, designed in the 1970s, was not designed for this, and would require the orbiter's computers be reset through a change of year, which could cause a glitch while in orbit. In 2007, NASA engineers devised a solution so shuttle flights could cross the year-end boundary. Topic. Launch After the final hold in the countdown at T-9 minutes, the shuttle went through its final preparations for launch, and the countdown was automatically controlled by the Ground Launch Sequencer GLS, software at the Launch Control Center, which stopped the count if it sensed a critical problem with any of the shuttle's onboard systems. The GLS handed off the count to the shuttle's onboard computers at T-31 seconds, in a process called auto-sequence start. At T-16 seconds, the massive sound suppression system SPS began to drench the mobile launcher platform MLP and SRB trenches with 300,000 US gallons 1,100 cubic meters of water to protect the orbiter from damage by acoustical energy and rocket exhaust reflected from the flame trench and MLP during lift-off. At T-10 10 seconds, hydrogen igniters were activated under each engine bell to quell the stagnant gas inside the cones before ignition. Failure to burn these gases could trip the onboard sensors and create the possibility of an overpressure and explosion of the vehicle during the firing phase. The main engine turbopumps also began charging the combustion chambers with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen at this time. The computers reciprocated this action by allowing the redundant computer systems to begin the firing phase. The three main engines SSMEs started at T6.6 seconds. The main engines ignited sequentially via the shuttle's general purpose computers GPCs at 120 millisecond intervals. All three SSMEs were required to reach 90% rated thrust within three seconds, otherwise the onboard computers would initiate an RSLS abort. If all three engines indicated nominal performance by T3 seconds, they were commanded to gimbal to liftoff configuration and the command would be issued to arm the SRBs for ignition at T0. Between T6.6 seconds and T3 seconds, while the SSMEs were firing but the SRBs were still bolted to the pad, the offset thrust caused the entire launch stack boosters, tank and orbiter to pitch down 650 mm in measured at the tip of the external tank. The three-second delay after confirmation of SSME operation was to allow the stack to return to nearly vertical. At T0 seconds, the eight frangible nuts holding the SRBs to the pad were detonated, the SSMEs were commanded to 100% throttle, and the SRBs were ignited. 
by t plus 0.23 seconds, the SRBs built up enough thrust for liftoff to commence, and reached maximum chamber pressure by t plus 0.6 seconds. The Johnson Space Center's Mission Control Center assumed control of the flight once the SRBs had cleared the launch tower. Shortly after liftoff, the shuttle's main engines were throttled up to 104.5% and the vehicle began a combined roll, pitch and yaw maneuver that placed it onto the correct heading, azimuth, for the planned orbital inclination and in a heads-down attitude with wings level. The shuttle flew upside down during the ascent phase. This orientation allowed a trim angle of attack that was favorable for aerodynamic loads during the region of high dynamic pressure, resulting in a net positive load factor, as well as providing the flight crew with a view of the horizon as a visual reference. The vehicle climbed in a progressively flattening arc, accelerating as the mass of the SRBs and main tank decreased. To achieve low orbit requires much more horizontal than vertical acceleration. This was not visually obvious, since the vehicle rose vertically and was out of sight for most of the horizontal acceleration. The near circular orbital velocity at the 380 kilometers, 236 miles altitude of the International Space Station is 27,650 kilometers per hour, 17,180 miles per hour, roughly equivalent to Mach 23 at sea level. As the International Space Station orbits at an inclination of 51.6 degrees, missions going there must set orbital inclination to the same value in order to rendezvous with the station. Around 30 seconds into ascent, the SSMEs were throttled down, usually to 72%, though this varied, to reduce the maximum aerodynamic forces acting on the shuttle at a point called max Q. Additionally, the propellant grain design of the SRBs caused their thrust to drop by about 30% by 50 seconds into ascent. Once the orbiter's guidance verified that max Q would be within shuttle structural limits, the main engines were throttled back up to 104.5%. This throttling down and back up was called the thrust bucket. To maximize performance, the throttle level and timing of the thrust bucket was shaped to bring the shuttle as close to aerodynamic limits as possible. At around T plus 126 seconds, pyrotechnic fasteners released the SRBs and small separation rockets pushed them laterally away from the vehicle. The SRBs parachuted back to the ocean to be reused. The shuttle then began accelerating to orbit on the main engines. Acceleration at this point would typically fall to 0.9 grams, and the vehicle would take on a somewhat nose-up angle to the horizon, it used the main engines to gain and then maintain altitude while it accelerated horizontally towards orbit. At about 5 and 3 quarter minutes into ascent, the orbiter's direct communication links with the ground began to fade, at which point it rolled heads up to reroute its communication links to the tracking and data relay satellite system. At about seven and a half minutes into ascent, the mass of the vehicle was low enough that the engines had to be throttled back to limit vehicle acceleration to 3 grams, 29.4 meters per square second or 96.5 feet per square second, equivalent to accelerating from 0 to 105.9 kilometers per hour, 65.8 miles per hour in a second. Second. The shuttle would maintain this acceleration for the next minute, and main engine cutoff occurred at about eight and a half minutes after launch. 
The main engines were shut down before complete depletion of propellant, as running dry would have destroyed the engines. The oxygen supply was terminated before the hydrogen supply, as the SSMEs reacted unfavorably to other shutdown modes. Liquid oxygen has a tendency to react violently, and supports combustion when it encounters hot engine metal. A few seconds after MECO, the external tank was released by firing pyrotechnic fasteners. At this point the shuttle and external tank were on a slightly suborbital trajectory, coasting up towards apogee. Once at apogee, about half an hour after MECO, the shuttle's orbital maneuvering system ohms engines were fired to raise its perigee and achieve orbit, while the external tank fell back into the atmosphere and burned up over the Indian Ocean or the Pacific Ocean depending on launch profile. The sealing action of the tank plumbing and lack of pressure relief systems on the external tank helped it break up in the lower atmosphere. After the foam burned away during re-entry, the heat caused a pressure buildup in the remaining liquid oxygen and hydrogen until the tank exploded. This ensured that any pieces that fell back to earth were small. Ascent tracking the shuttle was monitored throughout its ascent for short-range tracking 10 seconds before liftoff through 57 seconds after, medium range 7 seconds before liftoff through 110 seconds after and long range 7 seconds before liftoff through 165 seconds after. Short range cameras included 22 16 mm cameras on the mobile launch platform and 8 16 mm on the fixed service structure. Four high speed fixed cameras located on the perimeter of the launch complex plus an additional 42 fixed cameras with 16 mm motion picture film. Medium range cameras included remotely operated tracking cameras at the launch complex plus six sites along the immediate coast north and south of the launch pad, each with 800 mm lens and high speed cameras running 100 frames per second. These cameras ran for only 4 to 10 seconds due to limitations in the amount of film available. Long-range cameras included those mounted on the external tank, SRBs and orbiter itself which streamed live video back to the ground providing valuable information about any debris falling during ascent. Long-range tracking cameras with 400-inch film and 200-inch video lenses were operated by a photographer at Playalinda Beach as well as nine other sites from 38 miles north at the Ponce Inlet to 23 miles south to Patrick Air Force Base PAFB, An additional mobile optical tracking camera was stationed on Merritt Island during launches. A total of 10 HD cameras were used both for ascent information for engineers and broadcast feeds to networks such as NASA TV and HDNet. The number of cameras significantly increased and numerous existing cameras were upgraded at the recommendation of the Columbia Accident Investigation Board to provide better information about the debris during launch. Debris was also tracked using a pair of Weibel continuous pulse Doppler X band radars, one on board the SRB recovery ship MV Liberty Star positioned northeast of the launch pad and on a ship positioned south of the launch pad. Additionally, during the first two flights following the loss of Columbia and her crew, a pair of NASA WB-57 reconnaissance aircraft equipped with HD video and infrared flew at 60,000 feet 18,000 meters to provide additional views of the launch ascent. 
Kennedy Space Center also invested nearly $3 million in improvements to the digital video analysis systems in support of debris tracking. In orbit Once in orbit, the shuttle usually flew at an altitude of 320 km nmi, although the STS-82 mission reached 620 km nmi. In the 1980s and 1990s, many flights involved space science missions on the NASA, ESA Spacelab, or launching various types of satellites and science probes. By the 1990s and 2000s the focus shifted more to servicing the space station, with fewer satellite launches. Most missions involved staying in orbit several days to two weeks, although longer missions were possible with the extended duration orbiter add-on or when attached to a space station. STS-80 was the longest at almost 17 days and 16 hours. Re-entry and landing Almost the entire Space Shuttle re-entry procedure, except for lowering the landing gear and deploying the air data probes, was normally performed under computer control. The re-entry could be flown entirely manually if an emergency arose. The approach and landing phase could be controlled by the autopilot, but was usually hand-flown. The vehicle began re-entry by firing the orbital maneuvering system engines, while flying upside down, backside first, in the opposite direction to orbital motion for approximately three minutes, which reduced the shuttle's velocity by about 200 miles per hour, 322 kilometers per hour. The resultant slowing of the shuttle lowered its orbital perigee down into the upper atmosphere. The shuttle then flipped over, by pushing its nose down which was actually up relative to the Earth, because it was flying upside down. This ohms firing was done roughly halfway around the globe from the landing site. The vehicle started encountering more significant air density in the lower thermosphere at about 400,000 feet 120 kilometers, at around Mach 25, 8,200 meters per second 30,000 kilometers per hour, 18,000 miles per hour. The vehicle was controlled by a combination of RCS thrusters and control surfaces, to fly at a 40-degree nose-up attitude, producing high drag, not only to slow it down to landing speed, but also to reduce re-entry heating. As the vehicle encountered progressively denser air, it began a gradual transition from spacecraft to aircraft. In a straight line, its 40-degree nose-up attitude would cause the descent angle to flatten out, or even rise. The vehicle therefore performed a series of four steep S-shaped banking turns, each lasting several minutes, at up to 70 degrees of bank, while still maintaining the 40-degree angle of attack. In this way it dissipated speed sideways rather than upwards. This occurred during the hottest phase of re-entry, when the heat shield glowed red and the G-forces were at their highest. By the end of the last turn, the transition to aircraft was almost complete. The vehicle leveled its wings, lowered its nose into a shallow dive and began its approach to the landing site. 
The orbiter's maximum glide ratio – lift to drag ratio varied considerably with speed, ranging from 1 to 1 at hypersonic speeds, 2 to 1 at supersonic speeds and reaching 4.5, 1 at subsonic speeds during approach and landing. In the lower atmosphere, the orbiter flew much like a conventional glider, except for a much higher descent rate, over 50 meters per second. 180 kilometers per hour 110 miles per hour or 9800 fpm at approximately Mach 3, two air data probes, located on the left and right sides of the orbiter's forward lower fuselage, were deployed to sense air pressure related to the vehicle's movement in the atmosphere. Final approach and landing phase when the approach and landing phase began, the orbiter was at a 3,000 meters (9,800 feet) altitude, 12 kilometers (7.5 miles) from the runway. The pilots applied aerodynamic braking to help slow down the vehicle. The orbiter's speed was reduced from 682 to 346 kilometers per hour, 424 to 215 miles per hour, approximately at touchdown compared to 260 kilometers per hour or 160 miles per hour for a jet airliner. The landing gear was deployed while the orbiter was flying at 430 kilometers per hour, 270 miles per hour. To assist the speed brakes, a 12 meters 39 feet drag chute was deployed either after main gear or nose gear touchdown, depending on selected chute deploy mode, at about 343 kilometers per hour, 213 miles per hour. The chute was jettisoned once the orbiter slowed to 110 km per hour 68.4 miles per hour. Media related to landings of space shuttles at Wikimedia Commons <laughs> Post-landing processing After landing, the vehicle stayed on the runway for several hours for the orbiter to cool. Teams at the front and rear of the orbiter tested for presence of hydrogen, hydrazine, monomethylhydrazine, nitrogen tetroxide and ammonia fuels and by-products of the reaction control system and the orbiter's three apis. If hydrogen was detected, an emergency would be declared, the orbiter powered down and teams would evacuate the area. A convoy of 25 specially designed vehicles and 150 trained engineers and technicians approached the orbiter. Purge and vent lines were attached to remove toxic gases from fuel lines and the cargo bay about 45 to 60 minutes after landing. A flight surgeon boarded the orbiter for initial medical checks of the crew before disembarking. Once the crew left the orbiter, responsibility for the vehicle was handed from the Johnson Space Center back to the Kennedy Space Center. If the mission ended at Edwards Air Force Base in California, White Sands Space Harbor in New Mexico, or any of the runways the orbiter might use in an emergency, the orbiter was loaded atop the shuttle carrier aircraft, a modified 747, for transport transport back to the Kennedy Space Center, landing at the shuttle landing facility. Once at the shuttle landing facility, the orbiter was then towed 2 miles .2 kilometers along a towway and access roads normally used by tour buses and KSC employees to the orbiter processing facility where it began a months-long preparation process for the next mission. Topic. Landing sites 
NASA preferred space shuttle landings to be at Kennedy Space Center. If weather conditions made landing there unfavorable, the shuttle could delay its landing until conditions are favorable, touch down at Edwards Air Force Base, California, or use one of the multiple alternate landing sites around the world. A landing at any site other than Kennedy Space Center meant that after touchdown the shuttle must be mated to the shuttle carrier aircraft and returned to Cape Canaveral. Space Shuttle Columbia STS once landed at the White Sands Space Harbor, New Mexico. This was viewed as a last resort as NASA scientists believed that the sand could potentially damage the shuttle's exterior. There were many alternative landing sites that were never used. Topic: <inaudible> Risk contributors. An example of technical risk analysis for a STS mission is SPRA Iteration 3.1 Top Risk Contributors for STS-133. Micro-meteoroid orbital debris MMOD strikes Space Shuttle Main Engine SSME induced or SSME catastrophic failure Ascent debris strikes to TPS leading to LOCV on orbit or entry Crew error during entry RSRM induced RSRM catastrophic failure RSRM are the rocket motors of the SRBs COPV failure COPV are tanks inside the orbiter that hold gas at high pressure an internal NASA risk assessment study conducted by the Shuttle Program Safety and Mission Assurance Office at Johnson Space Center released in late 2010 or early 2011 concluded that the agency had seriously underestimated the level of risk involved in operating the shuttle. The report assessed that there was a 1 in 9 chance of a catastrophic disaster during the first nine flights of the shuttle but that safety improvements had later improved the risk ratio to 1 in 90. <laughs> Fleet history Topic. Flight timeline Topic. Major events Below is a list of major events in the Space Shuttle Orbiter Fleet. Sources, NASA Launch Manifest, NASA Space Shuttle Archive Topic. Disasters On January 28, 1986, Challenger disintegrated 73 seconds after launch due to the failure of the Wright SRB, killing all seven astronauts on board. The disaster was caused by low temperature impairment of an O-ring, a mission-critical seal used between segments of the SRB casing. Failure of the O-ring allowed hot combustion gases to escape from between the booster sections and burn through the adjacent external tank, leading to a sequence of events which caused the orbiter to disintegrate. Repeated warnings from design engineers voicing concerns about the lack of evidence of the O-ring safety when the temperature was below 53 degrees Fahrenheit (12 degrees Celsius) had been ignored by NASA managers. On February 1, 2003, Columbia disintegrated during re-entry, killing its crew of seven because of damage to the carbon-carbon leading edge of the wing caused during launch. 
Ground control engineers had made three separate requests for high-resolution images taken by the Department of Defense that would have provided an understanding of the extent of the damage, while NASA's Chief Thermal Protection System TPS engineer requested that astronauts on board Columbia be allowed to leave the vehicle to inspect the damage. NASA managers intervened to stop the Department of Defense's assistance and refused the request for the spacewalk, and thus the feasibility of scenarios for astronaut repair or rescue by Atlantis were not considered by NASA management at the time. Retirement NASA retired the Space Shuttle in 2011, after 30 years of service. The shuttle was originally conceived of and presented to the public as a space truck, which would, among other things, be used to build a United States space station in low Earth orbit in the early 1990s. When the U.S. space station evolved into the International Space Station project, which suffered from long delays and design changes before it could be completed, the retirement of the space shuttle was delayed several times until 2011, serving at least 15 years longer than originally planned. Discovery was the first of NASA's three remaining operational space shuttles to be retired. The final space shuttle mission was originally scheduled for late 2010, but the program was later extended to July 2011 when Michael Suffredini of the ISS program said that one additional trip was needed in 2011 to deliver parts to the International Space Station. The shuttle's final mission consisted of just four astronauts. Christopher Ferguson, commander, Douglas Hurley, pilot, Sandra Magnus, mission specialist 1, and Rex Walheim, mission specialist 2. They conducted the 135th and last space shuttle mission on board Atlantis, which launched on July 8, 2011, and landed safely at the Kennedy Space Center on July 21, 2011, at 5:57 a.m. Eastern Daylight saving time 957 coordinated universal time topic <inaudible> distribution of orbiters and other hardware nasa announced it would transfer orbiters to education institutions or museums at the conclusion of the space shuttle program each museum or institution is responsible for covering the $28.8 million cost of preparing and transporting each vehicle for display. Twenty museums from across the country submitted proposals for receiving one of the retired orbiters. NASA also made Space Shuttle Thermal Protection System tiles available to schools and universities for less than $25 each. About 7,000 tiles were available on a first-come, first-served basis, limited to one per institution. <laughs> Orbiters on display On April 12, 2011, NASA announced selection of locations for the remaining shuttle orbiters. Atlantis is on display at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, near Cape Canaveral, Florida. It was delivered to the Visitor Complex on November 2, 2012. Discovery was delivered to the Udvar Hazy Center of the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum in Chantilly, Virginia, near Washington, D.C. on April 19, 2012. 
On April 17, 2012, Discovery was flown atop a 747 shuttle carrier aircraft escorted by a NASA T-38 Talon Chase aircraft in a final farewell flight. The 747 and Discovery flew over Washington, D.C. and the metropolitan area around 10 a.m. and arrived at Dulles around 11 a.m. The flyover and landing were widely covered on national news media. Endeavor was delivered to the California Science Center in Los Angeles, California on October 14, 2012. It arrived at Los Angeles International Airport on September 21, 2012 escorted by two NASA F.A-18 Hornet chase aircraft, concluding a two-day, cross-country journey atop the shuttle carrier aircraft after stops at Ellington Field in Houston, Biggs Army Airfield in El Paso and the Dryden Flight Research Facility at Edwards Air Force Base, California. Enterprise Atmospheric Test Orbiter was on display at the National Air and Space Museum's Udvar Hazy Center but was moved to New York City's Intrepid Sea Air Space Museum in mid-2012. In August 2011, the NASA Office of Inspector General OIG published a Review of NASA's selection of display locations for the Space Shuttle orbiters. The review had four main findings. NASA's decisions regarding orbiter placement were the result of an agency created process that emphasized above all other considerations locating the orbiters in places where the most people would have the opportunity to view them. The team made several errors during its evaluation process, including one that would have resulted in a numerical tie among the Intrepid, the Kennedy Visitor Complex, and the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force, Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. There is no evidence that the team's recommendation or the administrator's decision were tainted by political influence or any other improper consideration. Some of the choices NASA made during the selection process, specifically, its decision to manage aspects of the selection as if it were a competitive procurement and to delay announcement of its placement decisions until April 2011 more than two years after it first solicited information from interested entities may intensify challenges to the agency and the selectees as they work to complete the process of placing the orbiters in their new homes." The NASA OIG had three recommendations, saying NASA should expeditiously review recipients' financial, logistical, and curatorial display plans to ensure they are feasible and consistent with the agency's educational goals and processing and delivery schedules. Ensure that recipient payments are closely coordinated with processing schedules, do not impede NASA's ability to efficiently prepare the orbiters for museum display, and provide sufficient funds in advance of the work to be performed, and Work closely with the recipient organizations to minimize the possibility of delays in the delivery schedule that could increase the agency's costs or impact other NASA missions and priorities. In September 2011, the CEO and two board members of Seattle's Museum of Flight met with NASA Administrator Charles Bolden, pointing out 
significant errors in deciding where to put its four retiring space shuttles. The errors alleged include inaccurate information on Museum of Flight's attendance and international visitor statistics, as well as the readiness of the Intrepid Sea Airspace Museum's exhibit site. Topic Orbiter Replicas on Display Independence, formerly known as Explorer, is a full-scale, high-fidelity replica of the Space Shuttle. It was built by Gard Lee in Apopka, Florida, installed at Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex in 1993, and moved to Space Center Houston in 2012. It was built using schematics, blueprints and archival documents provided by NASA and by shuttle contractors such as Rockwell International. While many of the features on the replica are simulated, some parts, including the landing gear's Michelin tires, have been used in the Space Shuttle program. The model is on display, mounted on top of the original shuttle carrier aircraft NASA 905 outside of the visitor's center. Pathfinder Honorary Orbiter Vehicle Designation, OV-098 is a space shuttle test simulator made of steel and wood. Constructed by NASA in 1977 as an unnamed test article, it was purchased in the early 1980s by the America Japan Society, Inc. which had it refurbished, named it, and placed it on display in the Great Space Shuttle Exhibition in Tokyo. The mock-up was later returned to the United States and placed on permanent display at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama, in May 1988. Topic hardware on display One of the Crew Compartment Trainer CCT flight and mid-deck training hardware was taken from the Johnson Space Center to the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force, another remains on display at JSC. The full fuselage trainer FFT, which includes the payload bay and aft section but no wings, went to the Museum of Flight in Seattle. The Mission Simulation and Training Facilities Shuttle Mission Simulator Fixed Base Simulator went to the Adler Planetarium in Chicago but due to funding issues was later transferred to the Stafford Air and Space Museum in Weatherford OK. The Motion Base Simulator went to the Texas A&M Aerospace Engineering Department in College Station, Texas, where it remains in storage awaiting funding or other disposition, and the Guidance and Navigation Simulator GNS went to the Wings of Dreams Aviation Museum in Stark, Florida. One of the single system trainers SSTs used in shuttle astronaut training went to the Virginia Air and Space Center in Hampton, Virginia, the other two remain on display at the Johnson Space Center. Topic in popular culture. Space shuttles have been features of fiction and non-fiction, from children's movies to documentaries. Early examples include the 1979 James Bond film Moonraker, the 1982 Activision video game Space Shuttle: A Journey into Space (1982), and G. Harry Stein's 1981 novel Shuttle Down. In the 1986 film Space Camp, Atlantis accidentally launches into space with a group of U.S. Space Camp participants as its crew. A space shuttle named Intrepid is featured in the 1989 film Moontrap. The 1998 film Armageddon portrays a combined crew of offshore oil rig workers and U.S. military staff who pilot two modified shuttles to avert the destruction of Earth by an asteroid. 
Retired American test pilots visit a Russian satellite in the 2000 Clint Eastwood adventure film Space Cowboys. The 2004 Bollywood movie Swades, where a space shuttle is used to launch a special rainfall monitoring satellite, was filmed at Kennedy Space Center in the year after the Columbia disaster that had taken the life of Indian American astronaut K.C. Chawla. The 2013 film Gravity features the fictional space shuttle Explorer during STS-157, whose crew are killed or left stranded after it is destroyed by a shower of high-speed orbital debris. On television, the 1996 drama The Cape portrays the lives of a group of NASA astronauts as they prepare for and fly shuttle missions. Odyssey 5 was a short-lived sci-fi series that features the crew of a space shuttle as the last survivors of a disaster that destroys Earth. The space shuttle has also been the subject of toys and models, for example, a large Lego space shuttle model was constructed by visitors at Kennedy Space Center, and smaller models have been sold commercially as a standard. Legoland. Set. A 1980 pinball machine space shuttle was produced by Zakaria and a 1984 pinball machine space shuttle, Pinball Adventure was produced by Williams and features a plastic space shuttle model among other artwork of astronauts on the play field. The Space Shuttle also appears in a number of flight simulator and space flight simulator games such as Microsoft Space Simulator, Orbiter, Flight Gear, X-Plane and Space Shuttle Mission 2007. Several Transformers toys were modeled after the Space Shuttle. The U.S. Postal Service has released several postage issues that depict the Space Shuttle. The first such stamps were issued in 1981, and are on display at the National Postal Museum. See also <laughs> <laughs> Notes <laughs>